So, uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, I'm very, very happy to present Dr. Candice Middlebrooks, um, currently at the National Human in the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, Candice got her BS in biotechnology at Rochester, followed by a master's in natural sciences at the University of Buffalo. For her PhD, she chose uh, Emory University to do genetics and molecular biology with a specific focus on genetic epidemiology. Um, and her research there was focused on trisomy 21. She moved on from there to the National Cancer Institute. She received a cancer research training award um, and was there looking uh, at bladder cancer. And then she moved from there to extend her training as a postdoc to NHGRI, very smart decision, um, and where she's been able to look at a whole range of, of cancers as well as sickle cell leg ulcers. She's currently a staff scientist at NHGRI um, and she actually collaborates with Dr. Davenport, who's, uh, is she hiding somewhere? I can't see her. Um, so without further ado, let me, uh, let me introduce Candice's talk. She's gonna talk about translational studies and risk refinement of genetic variants that increase risk of bladder, breast and hereditary melanoma. Okay, take it away, Candice. Thank you, Claire. And I just wanna thank the department for having me. It's always a pleasure to give talks to other scientists, especially other geneticists. So um, I'll just start um, just with a little bit about me if it will advance. Okay, so this is how I view my role in genetics. I view myself as like a translational geneticist. So I like the idea of going from, can you guys see my, the pointer? Yes. Okay, you can see where I'm pointing, great. Uh, I like from going from all of these possible genetic variants in the genome and figuring out ways to whittle them down to some good candidate SNPs for the lab folk. So this is pretty much the workflow that I see in my head of like how I go about doing that based on what type of data I have. So we're, you know, start off doing some type of association study with all the variants um, based off of what type of data set you have, you'll use a different type of um, analysis method. And then from there, once you have a good genomic region that you think is associated, figuring out which SNPs or genes in that region are actually contributing to the phenotype. So doing various annotations and um, other types of analyses that give you a better idea of what may be happening. And then once I have a good candidate, I like to you know, go and, and go through PubMed and try to figure out, okay, this is the biological mechanism. I think this might be the pathway and then passing it on to whoever does the lab work. I just wanna be very clear that even though the, the bottom part looks like a small part of the triangle, I recognize that this part of the triangle is huge for the lab folks. I'm just like emphasizing what part that I do in this process. So here's me in graduate school. I, I felt like this was something that would be good to show to the graduate students wasn't that long ago. Um, I was in the Emory Genetics Molecular Biology Program from 2007 to 2013. And at this point, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and I spoke with the students earlier about how I started off in the lab for undergrad and for my master's program. And then for my PhD, I switched over to computational, but I was still longing for um, a, a, more, a closer connection to the lab and a closer connection to what they were doing with these odds ratios and p-values after they were calculated. I wanted to see like, how could we figure out what those things were and like how they were acting in biology. And that's kind of what led me to that triangle of like doing that part of the work and learning how to do that. So I'm gonna just talk about the research that helped me learn how to do that. Um, and that was pretty much during my first and second postdoc. So here's an outline of what I'm gonna be talking about. The first part is gonna be about um, my first postdoc and it was pretty much following up a genome-wide association signal and learning how to do exactly what I just mentioned um, above. So I'm gonna go over some urinary bladder cancer statistics just so you guys have an idea of that type of cancer and the study that came before the work that I did and then the, my um, use of publicly available data to try to answer questions about what the GWASnet was doing. So that's a study, population study of unrelated individuals. And then the other thing I wanna talk about is a family study 
um, of this syndrome. So a lot of people have heard about hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, but there are other, you know, cancer syndromes that people have high um, risk for based off of a rare variant. And this is one of them. And it's called family atypical multiple mole melanoma. And I'm just gonna go over some background on that and how I went about answering questions um, related to if there are any other cancers that were associated with that syndrome. So starting off with the post genome wide association study, uh, urinary bladder cancer is the ninth most common cancer in the world. The annual, annual incidence is about 71,000 cases and there are about 15,000 deaths in the United States per year. And it's been shown that genetic risk may account for up to 30% of risk, although most of the risk is related to smoking and um, certain professions and being exposed to certain chemicals from that profession. So while, since we knew that there was a genetic component, um, the group at NCI, at the Genetic Epidemiology Department, did two very large studies, and they combined those studies, combined the results from those studies in a meta-analysis. And these were the results that they came up with. These were the top regions highlighted here in yellow. So by the time I got to NCI, they had done a lot of work on many of these regions. And a lot of the SNPs, or some of the SNPs, were actually within a gene. So that, I don't want to say makes it easier, but you kind of have an idea like, okay, this is probably the gene. And you know, just figuring out what that SNP might be doing in that gene is um, not relatively easy, but it's more straightforward because you can look and see like it's in this amino acid. Um, the region that I worked on was in the apobac 3 a region, which is intragenic, not in a gene. Um, so, you know, you have to do a little bit more work to figure out what may be going on. So this was the region I was given. So when we zoom into this region on 22Q13.1, the SNP is upstream of two genes, one being apobac 3 a the other one being CBX6. So I just started doing research on this region, um, looking up literature, trying to figure out, has this region been associated with another disease? Um, are any of these genes interesting candidates based off papers that have been published? And I became very interested in this apobac 3 gene in that region, and I'll explain why. So the ApoBec3 gene family is a family of enzymes that convert deoxycytidine residues to deoxyuridine, and they act on a particular substrate. They act on single-stranded RNA and single-stranded DNA, which assumingly we evolved to be able, they evolved to be able to do that um, because viral um, DNA or genomes are usually single-stranded. And so they use that substrate they introduce a lot of mutations in that um, DNA, and they make it so that the virus can't make functional proteins in order to make additional viruses. But they've seen that um, in some cases, our DNA is single-stranded, like during replication and other um, moments during the cell cycle. And so at that point, our DNA can be a substrate for this enzyme. And people were starting to prove that this enzyme or these enzymes, the whole family, might be introducing mutations in our DNA and causing cellular transformation. So I thought that this was a very interesting candidate um, potentially in that region. And another important thing to note is that these enzymes introduce a particular uh, signature in the, in the genome. So it's not just a normal like, mutation, it actually leaves a pattern of mutations that can be distinguished from other types of mutations. So people can write computer code and look across the genome and identify where these types of mutations are. So I was reading up on this story, becoming very interested. Um, upon further examination of this region, I found that in addition to this SNP that was in the genome-wide association study, there was also a copy number variant in this region. And this copy number variant resulted from some type of historic event where there was a probably a recombination event between ApoBec 3A and ApoBec 3B in the 3' UTR. So I, I said this was a gene family and they're very similar in sequence, especially in this 3' UTR. So there's probably some type of homolog homologous recombination event and that resulted in loss of this region in some people. And some people have this chimeric um, protein. What's special about this is since it's a combination of both these genes, it has the more active ApoBec3A coding region, so resulting in a more active 
um, protein, but it also has this three prime UCR that increases the half-life of that mRNA and makes it last longer in the cell. So you have this more active um, protein that introduces lots of mutations and can exist longer in the cell. So it was starting, this was starting to shape up to be even more interesting than it originally was. So I started to wonder, you know, when you do a genome-wide association study, the SNP that you find for that region is a representative. It's a representative of the entire region of the genome that is in that haplotype block. So could this copy number variant, which was not tested in the GWAS because they only looked at SNPs, is this the actual variant that's underlying that signal? So I became curious about figuring that out. So I started reading up on that copy number variant to see if it was associated with any other diseases. And I found this study where they looked at this copy number variant in a population of people of Asian descent. That is important to note, remember that. <laughs> um, it's gonna be important later on in the story that they found this association in people of Asian descent. So um, in stage one, they did the multi-stage association study similar to NCI, and this is stage two, and then they combined it, and it was highly significant um, as far as increased risk of breast cancer. So I started being even more curious about this variant as far as its potential in being the cause of what we were seeing in bladder cancer. Um, so like I said, we didn't have the, the deletion typed in our samples, but sometimes you can take GWAS data and you can identify a copy number variants from the SNP data, but they would not give me the SNP data. I don't know why <laughs> they wouldn't give me the full data set. So I couldn't like do the intensity plot analysis because I needed intensity plots to be able to identify any copy number variants in this region. So I was like, okay, well maybe I can find a good tag SNP for this deletion. Like does the SNP that we have um, tag this deletion? If so, if it's a really high R squared, I could find a SNP that I can test in association, I'm sorry, an association for, and if it's associated and it's also highly correlated with a deletion, that would mean the deletion is probably associated. So I started looking up papers to see if anyone else had done this. And I, um, all the graduate students in here always look up papers because you, you, know, you don't wanna reinvent the wheel. Someone may have already done it and someone had already done it. So here's their paper. The X axis is position along chromosome 22 and the Y axis is the R squared value within different populations. So on the bottom is people of Asian descent and then the middle are people of Caucasian descent from America and the top is Yoruba. And there weren't really any SNPs that were good predictors of the alleles of the deletion. Um, in Yoruba, there's this one SNP where the R squared is maybe about 0.6, but that's not really a good um, tag SNP for the deletion. We usually want it to be at least the R squared of 0.9, you know, as far as predictability. So I didn't really see any SNPs um, that seemed like they would be good tags. So I requested that our lab um, type the deletion in some of the samples if they could get their hands on them because it was everything's protected in the government. So it was just a lot of work getting the samples, but they were able to get the samples and, and type the deletion. So let me explain why I really wanted to ask this question. So I wanted to know if that variant was acting as a confounder in the association or was it directly um, underlying the association? And what a I'll explain what a confounder is for anyone who doesn't know. So here we're seeing this GWAS variant, which may be somewhat correlated with Apelbeck's signature and that might be how it's acting. And that might be the mediator for increased risk for higher bladder cancer. But if you have this copy number variant that is highly correlated with the SNP and also potentially having this effect on the independent variables, higher bladder cancer risk through this Apelbeck signature, since these two variants may be correlated from R squared in our data set, we may just be picking up the, the signal from the copy number variant if it's acting like a confounder, confounder, or it could be that both of them are contributing in some kind of way. So the only way you could really decipher that with the data is to have the variant typed and then do a full model where you include the GWAS SNP and the deletion and see how much each is contributing um, once you add them both in because they'll adjust each other out and you'll see the um, independent effects of each. So that is what we did in a subset of samples. And these are the results. 
So here's the variance here from the GWAS. And this focus on the p-value. Um, in the subset of samples we looked at, p-value was 10 to the negative 6. And once adjusted for the deletion, the p-value was still 10 to the negative 6. So it didn't seem to attenuate the signal by including that deletion. And when we looked at the deletion, there was some level of signal. And then once it was adjusted for by the SNP, we lose it. So that's telling us that it's probably the SNP. And these are different signals and different haplotype blocks doing potentially different things. So this is where the story is right now. The SNPs seem to be directly causing bladder cancer or that region around the SNP. And the deletions seem to be something independent happening, um, increasing risk of breast cancer. So at this point, I wanted to fine map the region around the SNP. So as I mentioned earlier, the SNP just represents that entire genomic region or haplotype block. It could be any SNP in that region that's actually the, the causal SNP. So sometimes we'll do imputation where we have our, you see our study genotypes on the bottom and we know some of the um, alleles and then some of them we don't know, but we can use a reference, reference haplotype to impute variants into this data set because you know ancestral relatedness, we can use this information from other people. And so I did this imputation and then redid the association analysis to see if there were other candidate SNPs that might be the causal SNP. And here are the results of that. So the gray empty circles are the imputed SNPs, the black are the GWAS, and then these three colorful SNPs. One is the GWAS SNP and the other two are um, other variants that popped up as being significantly associated. So it could have been any one of these SNPs that was actually causing the signal. And so I was like, okay, so here's our candidates. Now, what else can I do? So normally, um, based off your lab resources, you'd have to go and like ask someone to do some lab work because what else can you do at this point? But at NCI at the time, and, and some of the cancer people may know that they were working on this database called the Cancer Genome Atlas. And it was this massive undertaking um, with a bunch of different groups who worked on 33 different tumor types um, with 10 of them being rare cancers across thousands of patients. And they collected all of these different types of data points. They collected blood, um, they collected tissue, they collected um, data on the cancer, and they just put it all up on a database for us to download and try to ask questions related to our research without having to use our lab resources. So that was pretty awesome. And so I was like, okay, great. So my SNP is intragenic, it's in the middle of nowhere. I can try to do, you know, EQTLs and see if the SNP seems to be an enhancer of any of the genes nearby. So, sorry, I have alarms going off. So um, I went ahead and found a SNP that was one of the SNPs that I imputed in. They didn't have my SNP in the TCGA database, but you can look and see if there's a SNP um, that has a higher square, which was this ended up being one of the candidates from the invitation. Downloaded that data, downloaded RNA-seq version two data, which is isoform data, not just gene level, but isoform. Are there, you know, is there a particular isoform that the SNP is driving expression of, as well as other data points that I could use in the EQTL and adjust out other things that I wasn't interested in. And I just wanted to make sure um, anyone who doesn't do this every day, um, I wanted to go over a linear regression because that's pretty much what an EQCL is. So we use linear regression for EQCLs and it's pretty much the formula for a line. So you guys remember Y equals MX plus B. And here is the formula for a linear regression. So in these two, the Y here is pretty much the same as the Y here, it's the dependent variable. The B here is pretty much the same as this. This is the Y intercept. Um, the M is slope, the X is the X variable. The only thing that's really different is the random error term. And that's pretty much all of the error or like difference or variation that is not explained or captured by your variable because there'll be other things that can affect ex expression. So that's whatever is left. And so that's pretty much it. And this is what it looks like on a graph. 
So along the x-axis is number of, of risk alleles for this model. Along the y-axis is gene expression level. And we're gonna look at expression levels for everybody who's GG, everyone who's AG, and everyone who's AA. And so it might look something like this, where each one of these data points is expression data from a person. And all of these people, like I said, are GG. And what we're testing is as you go up and increase the number of risk alleles, does expression of something increase or decrease? And that's pretty much what you're testing. That's pretty much what a linear regression does. And so if you look, this is, you guys know the formula for a line. This is all it is. Um, so there's going to be, I'm going to mention beta coefficients a lot. So I just wanted to be very clear about what a beta coefficient is. It's the slope of a line. It's how much does expression level on average increase for every unit increase in the number of risk alleles. That's all a beta coefficient is. So I'm going to use it a lot. Just make sure you know you understand now so that I can talk about it later on. Um, also important is the directionality. So if your beta coefficient or your slope is negative, that means as risk alleles increase, expression decreases. So positive is going up, negative means the relationship is going down. I think everybody should be fine, wonderful with the EQTLs. I sure hope they are. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I, I didn't want to, because I know, you know, I when I was in the lab, I didn't know what this stuff was. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was clear. Okay, that's, good. that's good. Okay. Um, so I did that analysis for all of the isoforms in relation to the SNP, and only one of these was significant. If, if you look, it's pretty clear that it, there was an association with apoback 3 b specifically the major isoform. Lucky for me, they also annotate the deletion isoform. So I had that data and I was like, okay, there's no relationship here between this deletion isoform and um, expression of, I'm, I'm, yeah, between that gene and the SNP. So I was like, okay, this is, this is interesting. This is cool. Um, and this is what that looks like. This is similar to the figure I just showed you. And directionality looks like what we'd expect as you have more risk alleles that increase your risk of bladder cancer, it was high level of this apoback 3 b So it was looking like this was a good candidate for the underlying reason why this SNP is associated with bladder cancer. So now I want to ask, okay, we see this relationship with expression. Is the SNP also associated with more signature or mutations in the bladder tissue? Because that's the phenotype that based off of what we're thinking is that would be the phenotype we'd be interested in. So I found another data set um, on this website called FireBrowse. And what FireBrowse does for all the cancer people, if you don't know, they do additional analyses to the TCGA data and then make it available. So one of the analyses they did that I luckily didn't have to do was identify mutation signature from apoback enzymes in the tumor tissues from TCGA and they made that available. So now I could ask this question to see if the SNP was correlated with those, um, the numbers of mutations in the tissue. So once again, there's the Apoback 3B expression. And when I looked at signature, we see that same relationship. So it seemed like the SNP was um, able to predict that and everything seemed to fit together that this may be the mechanism by which bladder cancer's risk is increased um, related to this SNP. So now I was like, okay, Enhancers are sometimes tissue specific. So is this something that only happens in bladder cancer? And if not, then when we have seen this SNP be associated with another cancer at some point, and I, I didn't see that in the literature. So I wanted to ask that question. And I felt like breast cancer was a good you know, cancer to look at since they already show this relationship with signature, but for a different variant. So I wanted to look to see if the SNP from the GWAS was in any way related to signature or expression of 3B. So I did the same thing, but in breast tissue. And it seemed like there were interactions between that region where the SNP is in multiple different isoforms all around this gene. So I was like, okay, that's weird. Um, and there also seemed to be some relationship with 3B. I was like, all right, uh, let me go ahead and, and look at what signature looks like in breast in relation to the SNP. So here's the um, EQTL for the SNP versus A3B. So it might be driving expression. But when I looked at signature, there was no relationship with Apobex signature 
in relation to that SNP. So I was like, okay, well, maybe it's an enhancer in some way, but it didn't seem to have that same effect that we were seeing in bladder. So this was an important question to ask, in my opinion, because there were studies out at the time that were saying Apovac 3A was the main mutator. They had done all this work. It has that interesting chimeric protein. And so people were very focused on that. And they were, this was came from a paper. They said these clinical observations raised the intriguing possibility that hypermutation in bladder cancers, mainly by Apovac 3A, could contribute substantially to the success of immune therapy. So focusing on that gene for every cancer, including bladder. And I wasn't finding evidence that that was the case based off the data I was looking at. So I kind of I wanted to know which particular enzymes were contributing to signature in bladder versus breast to see if there was evidence that they were you know, behaving differently and there maybe needed to be a different gene or enzyme that was targeted based off of what type of cancer you had. So here's the model we're testing. The SNP seem to be driving expression of Apovac 3B mRNA and therefore increasing enzyme and leading to Apovac mutagenesis in bladder cancer. And the deletion seem to be doing the same thing in breast cancer. But I needed to ask that question directly in breast and also see, was there any um, con contribution of Apovac 3B to mutagenesis in breast and, and vice versa? Because I only looked at the SNP but I didn't look directly at the expression of these enzymes to see if they were correlated. So I just wanted to do a, a big model with all of the different enzymes or isoforms from these enzymes and see which one was um, contributing to signature in these tissues. But I was worried because as I mentioned earlier, the isoform um, that you would get from 3A is gonna be very similar to the isoform from 3AB. So I was wondering like, okay, were they, did they have a good enough probe to detect the difference between this isoform versus this isoform? And they pretty much need a really good probe across this region that was actually different between the two. So I was like, okay, how can I ask this? Well, if I can get data on who has the deletion in their you know, sequence and relate that to expression levels of the actual deletion isoform, then I could say like, okay, since this is correlated, since the deletion genotype is correlated with expression of the chimera, then they probably did a good job of distinguishing between those two. So I, I looked for someone, since there are so many people working on this, um, Apovac deletion, I looked for someone who actually typed the deletion in the samples. So once again, I wouldn't have to do it. So I, I found a paper where they made this data available from when they looked at the sequence band files. So this group, um, did the, the deletion typing in a subset of samples. So at the top, you see the non-carriers, middle are the heads, you can see the, it's coming up halfway and they had the homozygotes and this is how their figures looked. And it's like, okay, I can use this data and see if they were, if this predicts expression, then I would know that they were able to distinguish between those two isoforms. So here's the data for that. The top is bladder and they had it for 105 of the 366 samples. Um, and here's the isoforms for Apovec 3A, the deletion isoform and the major isoform. And this is what I saw. So remember I told you guys about beta coefficients and directionality. So as you had more deletion, you had less of the normal A3A, less of the normal 3B, and you had more of the three, A3AB deletion. So directionality looks good. The p-value isn't quite significant, but there wasn't a lot of power because there's not a lot of people in this data set that actually had the deletion, but it was enough to be significant for the deletion isoform. But when we looked at breasts, same thing, um, negative correlation, negative correlation, positive correlation. And those were all significant, but that's because we had the power to detect those differences. So this was a good sign that I could use that isoform data and do this analysis that I, I wanted to you know, be able to see which one was contributing to signature. So here's the results of that. Um, along the x-axis are our beta coefficients. Um, the negative represents negative correlations. The positive is over here. Positives are in blue, negatives are in red. And these are all of the different isoforms. So if you look at the top, the Apovac 3B major isoform was most significantly correlated with signature in bladder. Then there was some slight correlation with Apovac 3A. 
But when you look at the deletion, you don't see any relationship um, with signature and bladder. And also of note, if you remember, I, I told you or asked you to remember that they did that study of the deletion in, in an Asian population. The deletion is a more common variant in Asian populations. I think um, frequency is 0.3, but in Caucasians, it's more like 0 0.0 something. It was much lower. So seeing this told me like, okay, the reason why we're seeing this group having less um, signatures because they have the, probably because they have more deletion variant, which deletes this Apobac 3B and results in them having lower signature. So I was like, oh, that's, that makes sense. So then I looked in breast tissue and you see the opposite. You see that in Asian individuals, they have the most signature and it's because probably they have that deletion variant. And then you see A3A and A3, um, the A3A deletion being the most significant contributor's signature with no real contribution from A3B. So now I wanted to know, okay, out of the SNPs that were candidates, which one is more likely to be the actual causal variant? So I just did basic bioinformatic analysis just to see which SNPs overlap with binding sites. And my guess would have been this RS17000 variant because it's like an enhancer binding site and all this stuff. And this just goes to show you that bioinformatics will only take you so far. You definitely need to go in the lab because this is just, you know, their guesses, um, best guesses based off the sequences. So what we saw was that SNP that I thought was the SNP didn't have differential binding based off the alleles. It binds whether it's G or A. The SNP from the GWAS binds preferentially if there's a T allele and doesn't really bind if there's a C allele. And then that other, other SNP doesn't really have any um, binding through the electrophoretic um, mobility shift assay. So it seemed like this SNP would be the best SNP. I would have liked a luciferase assay, but they didn't, they did other things, but yeah, it looked like it was that SNP. And last but not least, to tie everything to the clinic, um, I wanted to see if the SNP was predictive of any clinical phenotypes, which would make this really potentially useful to clinicians and patients. So this is a survival curve. And at the top, um, what the, the x-axis is months. So how many months post like surgery or treatment does someone survive? And this is overall survival. So we see, we saw something really interesting. When you have the risk allele, which is in blue, you have higher survival than the people who had um, the heterozygote or the homozygote non-risk allele. So the risk allele was actually helpful for survival. And so I also looked at um, the breakdown of signature levels. So blue and purple were the higher 50% signature levels and the green and salmon were the lower signature levels. We also see um, the same thing with, if you have more signature, you have longer survival. So I, I wasn't expecting that, but I, I have ideas on why I think that is and why this happened this way, but it was just very interesting to see that. So that's pretty much that story and how I learned how to work through data and, and use what is publicly available in papers and everywhere else to try to answer questions about um, your GWAS SNP or whatever association SNP. And here's the final model with everything in play. So moving on um, to the family study. Uh, this study was, like I said, about a, different families that had FAM syndrome. And FAM syndrome is caused usually by rare high-risk variants, and some of them are in this gene called CDKN2A. So first, I'll just talk about melanoma a little bit. So melanoma is a cancer that originates in the melanocytes within the basal layer of the skin, and it is the most aggressive form of skin cancer. There are around 87,000 new cases of melanoma and around 10,000 deaths in 2017. Approximately five to 10% of these cancers occur in families with these hereditary melanoma predispositions versus sporadic. And those cases tend to occur earlier, so age 34 compared to sporadic cases, which occur on average around age 54. And that risk for your lifetime risk is between 50 and 90%. So it's really, really high, especially if you have a mutation in CDKN2A. So I just wanted to give a little bit of history 
so that people can know how these types of family studies were done in the past and why these other cancers haven't been associated with these syndromes yet, why melanoma was the first one. Well, the reason is back in the 1800s when this was discovered, there weren't a lot of technologies to be able to figure out who had cancer and who didn't. So basically you had to rely on your eyes. And so a clinician saw that one of his patients had a lot of nevi or moles on his skin and they would transform and grow and spread. And so he called it a fungoid. I don't think they knew the word for cancer back then or didn't know that this was cancer, but they, he knew something was wrong. He also noted that other people in the family had the same phenotype. So he figured out like, okay, this is something um, related to these moles and they're hereditary. And that's how people, this was the first um, case that was known of FAM syndrome because you could see it. But as technology has advanced and we have better technology for detection, they were able to determine that pancreatic cancer also occurs more commonly in these families. And there's been evidence that breast and lung cancer may be associated as well. So the first gene that was discovered um, was CDKN2A. And the reason why it was discovered is because most of these families have a mutation in CDKN2A. So while there have been other genes that have been discovered, uh, we focused on this gene first because such high risk in so many people having it, it was just more, we had more power to study this gene. And why is this gene so detrimental and increasing risk so much more than these other variants? Well, this gene actually codes for two different proteins. Um, something with the splicing and a frame shift or something happens where you get ARF protein and INK4A protein. Both of these different proteins, they're functionally different, but they both act in the cell cycle. So when you have a mutation in this gene, you have a mu mutated two different proteins that are both involved in the cell cycle. So, um, the way I got involved in this project was through a clinician named Henry Lynch. Um, he was, has been watching these families for like decades. So he enrolled them in this study, maybe in the sixties or something. And he's been watching them over time. And, you know, they have a few people with melanoma, but they would start to see other cancers popping up in these families. And they're like, this is not normal. There's a lot more cancer in these families than I would expect by chance. And I'm wondering if it's related to that mutation in CDKN2A, but he needed someone to do the statistical analysis just to see if there was statistical evidence that that was the case. So I started, um, Joan got me involved in this project working with him, which was great. And we had 1,085 individuals across 10 different families. Um, they had already typed the deletion in some of the people and figured out which deletion was in a given family. And we also had data on their age at last cancer follow-up, their age at diagnosis of the cancer, gender and smoking habits. And these were the various cancers that were observed in those families. So the known cancers are potentially associated cancers like breast and lung as well. And then these were the other cancers that popped up in those families. In addition, I had pedigree data and pedigree data is useful if you need to infer genotypes. So if you look here where there's a P or an N, those are people who are directly tested. But if you know, you can kind of figure out who the obligate carriers are in the family because they connect other carriers that were known carriers. So this person and this person and this person were all inferred to be positive carriers. So this pedigree data is very helpful in helping us infer genotypes. So I know you guys know, uh, many of you know what survival analysis is. Once again, I just wanna make sure because I'm gonna just show some plots. So this is pretty much the breakdown or the scheme of a, a cohort study. You have two groups in this example, someone with a mutation and then the other group um, doesn't have a mutation. And we're just watching to see who develops cancer and when. So here's our survival curve with age and years on the bottom and probability of being cancer-free. So starting out in the study, 100% of people are cancer-free. So we start up here. And then after about 25 years, we're looking and we're seeing two people with mutation develop cancer, one person with no mutation develop cancer. So now the plot looks like this. And then after time, um, we'll see that 
the mutation carriers would potentially have um, lower probability of being cancer free than in no mutation group. And this is what we would expect it to look like. And for the hazard ratio, for the Cox proportional hazards ratio, um, we're looking and comparing probability of cancer in the carriers versus non-carriers. And the higher that number is, the higher the chance of cancer is in the mutation carriers. So the first question I asked was just in the known cancers. And this is pretty much just characterizing our data set and making sure like, okay, we know that melanoma and pancreatic cancer occurs at a higher rate. So we're expecting a big difference between carriers and non-carriers for this. And we just wanted to see what the plot would look like. And of course, it looks like what we expect. It looks like the figure I just showed you. So the non-carriers on the top, carriers um, in blue, and we can see that there's a huge difference in um, survival probability between those groups. In fact, carriers are 100 times more likely in this data set to develop melanoma or pancreatic cancer than non-carriers. So that's that plot on the left. So now we wanna look at these other cancers and this is all other cancers other than pancreatic, melanoma, breast or lung, which have been um, slightly implicated, all of them grouped together. And we see the, the same pretty much big difference where non-carriers are up here and carriers are here and there's significant increase in risk for these other cancers. And the carriers were found to be 20 times more likely to develop other cancers than non-carriers. And that was highly significant. So the conclusions from this second study, um, we found that people have higher risk of these other cancers. And why is that useful? Obviously in clinic, we wanna know this because maybe they need to be screened for these other cancers. And currently insurance companies may not be covering them for that. So if they need this additional screening, this might be evidence that they need to have that included in their um, insurance. And so currently I'm working on a few other cancer syndromes. I'm working on hereditary breast and ovarian cancer as well as Lynch syndrome and trying to figure out if, if basically asking the same question for those data sets. And hopefully those data will be published very soon. I'm saying a prayer, <laughs> but yeah, that's basically it. But I want to thank everyone who was involved in these projects, um, Jones Group, NCI, and Dr. Henry T. Lynch's group. And I wanna ask if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask me any questions. That was a great presentation, Candice. It's always great to see my collaborator doing hey. great work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I guess I did have a question about your first study with the breast cancer and the APO deletion, um, are they looking at that in the clinic? Like how you sh uh, just mentioned with the second study? I mean, are, do they see, I mean, are there con continued studies being done to look at that APOE B deletion in breast cancer? And has it been, is, it, is there like a, cl a clinical impact? Well, I see other people working to follow this up and understand why they're different. I forget that group that I was in at the time, they were following up and they, they had a paper on it. And I never read it. Um, I haven't read it yet, but they saw something. <laughs> I know they're following it up though, um, but it's, there's work being done to try to figure out why, why there's a difference at all. Like what's result, like what can they target and why there's a difference between breast and bladder and are there other cancers that maybe are more impacted by one of the other family members with April Beck. So I know that they're following that up. I'm not sure if those have been published yet. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if like maybe there is like a targeted therapy or something that can, I don't know, for, for that deletion. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank I'd you. I'd be really excited to see that because, you know, <laughs> it would be, be cool, a cool ending to the story. Yeah. Thank you, Candice. Um, I'd quite like it if you comment more generally on cancer as a syndrome. Uh, there's a sort of debate about is cancer one thing or is it a, just a cluster of diseases and what you see of the commonalities in general between the cancers you've discussed today. In general, genetics. In, in <laughs> that's, genetics the only, yes. that's the only thing I can come up with because I do feel like 
even within one tissue, all of the cancers, if it arises in a different cell, be different from someone else's, you know, cancer lobular is different than luminal and all of these things and triple negative is different than it. So I feel like they're all grouped by anatomy, but they're all different diseases. You have to use different drugs and do, yeah, I view them as very heterogeneous from everything I've learned. And the only thing that's the same is some abnormality in genetics. But yeah, that's just how I view it. Candace, lovely, lovely presentation. Oh, let me let me start my video. I'm eating eating, eating at the same time. Sorry. Uh, lovely presentation. Uh, do you know if there's any linkage with germline mutations in humans for the alleles you found that are causal in in uh, cancers? And I I asked that against the backdrop that might help you. We've just finished sequencing a family of 150 individuals, um, and we've taken and it's dense dense sequence, and we've then looked at the mutation rate as a function of inbreeding generations. So I should add the the, the qualifier that these are mice, <laughs> but oh. uh, let's hold off on that admission uh, to a late late stage. So we know the so we've been um, estimating the uh, mutation rates, germline mutation rates. And um, this is David Ashbrook, who's also uh, very interested in your talk. Um, we found that a, a gene that's involved in cancers, um, MUT-YH, is involved in germline C to A uh, transitions in the family. So we have a, high, a, a parental haplotype that's a high mutator, and one of the other parents is the low mutator. And so in a family, we have optimal power. And, and the, the cool thing, the reason we came across this, and we're pretty sure we had the right gene, which you don't usually have, is because of the cancer biology on MUT-YH. I'm just wondering whether that's been done in humans to find natural variants to control germline mutation. Um. <laughs> Germ line disease, so yeah, that's, well, I know there are some people trying to think who study higher chance or higher rates of certain um, structural changes. And that's basically based on intrinsic things in the, in the genome that result in a higher chance of there being a structural variant that's created there. So I think that might be an example, but it's like a structural variant change that is based on not necessarily a particular SNP that increases risk of high having higher mutation. It's based off that sequence being homologous with some other region. And so it's commonly um, resulting in a deletion or a duplication. So I feel like that might be something um, where they see like a germline variant or germline genomic profile that increases your risk of a germline variant um, if you have that sequence. But I don't know if I've seen or know of, I just don't know of a lot of people. I don't know a lot of people who study that germline variants that increase germline mutations. It's always germ, like for this, it was a germline variant that increased it, the somatic mutation rate. So I, I, don't, I don't know a lot of people study that, but it's very interesting. Sounds like it would be a, a mutation that would affect uh, at a reproductive level. Right. Because that's where the mutations are happening is right at the beginning. Right. So I, I don't I can't think of one that I know of in particular. Yeah. Um, hi, Candace. Thank you for the talk. I found it interesting. I'll start my video so you can see me. So I sort of have a separate question about the April Beck story. So if I understand it correctly, you have a situation where population has uh, lower or loss of expression of April back and in a different population have increased expression and it has a role in viral defense. So a lot of cancers can also be caused by viruses. So I'm wondering if there's any evidence that you see that cancers that have a viral um, cause or like cervical cancer or things of, of that nature show differences based on this April back status. There are definitely people studying that like how much does having these types of infections that increase the risk of HPV, if you are exposed to that 
and you lead to increased expression of an apoBEC, would that lead to greater mutations in that person and, and lead to higher risk of cancer? And I know there are people studying that. I just can't remember what they found, but it's definitely of interest because there's some interplay between the viral, the virology people and the genetics people on that question. And so there are definitely people studying that, but I don't remember what they found, but there are definitely people studying that. It's very, I mean, it makes sense that that could happen. I think in like cervical and head and neck cancers that are involved with HPV, you see like certain apobec mutation signatures in like the PIK3CA gene, I know. Mm. So there and I guess there. related to this, can you, can you remind me which population, because um, you mentioned that the Asian population had different, uh, either lower or higher, I can't recall. But um, I know HTLV is endemic to that region. And I'm wondering if there's like a selective pressure because why, why enrichment in certain populations to have less or more of this, uh, of this particular enzyme? Or do you just think it was a neutral selection? But I'm, I'm wondering any thoughts about if there's evolutionary pressure for loss or gain of this site. Right, so I was, I wondered that because there's such a big difference. Well, so the, to answer the first question, it was the Asian population. So both Japanese and Chinese individuals that had um, higher levels of that deletion or higher frequency. And so I did wonder like, was there some type of event that resulted in a bottleneck where they, you know, if you had that, you had um, greater chance of survival and then it just, propagated it just was like some selection where you needed that in order to survive and I don't know of any particular like historic events that would have resulted in a bottleneck but I, I wondered that I just I'm not um not a population biologist obviously but I, I wondered that question and I didn't know how to ask it or answer it because I and that would have also taken me off track it was slightly different answer or question than I was focused on, but I was really curious about that just as a researcher, like why would that be at such a different frequency in that group? Yeah, I, I was, yeah, I was wondering if there was any sort of studies out there because it seemed like a, an interesting difference. Uh, one would naively assume you'd want it, but obviously it's not so simple. So, right. Uh, I mean, it could have been an event that happened where there was like a, some type of viral, like like this pandemic, or, but maybe a different, like a viral pandemic where if you had that ApoBec um, gene or that particular mutator, you were better at fighting off whatever virus, but then you had this other effect where you had increased risk of cancer. And then, but the cancer phenotype wouldn't be selected again since you could still have kids before you develop the cancer. So that would be just a side effect thing that will happen. But I, I, I wonder that, I, I think it could yeah. be. I don't know. We'll throw, we'll throw it to kin selection or the grandparents having a positive role or something. Who knows? Um, and then the CDK, in, uh, basically the second part of your story. So obviously there's higher rates in melanoma and pancreatic cancer. It has influences more broadly, but is there, is there an understanding of why they're preferentially affected? Why those organ systems are harmed more? I've had um, my guess, and I don't know, but my guess was that since melanocytes are already, um, what is it called? You notice that they're growing off top of each other. So if you have a mole, it's already overcome some type of um, barrier in, in cell division where it can grow more, a little bit more than it's supposed to. It's not malignant, but it's, I forget what it's called, but it's hyper something where it, it grows a little bit too much because they're growing on top of each other. It's hyperplastic. Um, yeah, it's hyperplastic. Hyperplastic. Thank you. <laughs> hyperplastic. Um, so I feel like it's already kind of hyperplastic. Maybe it just needs one more thing to, to transform it into not just being hyperplastic, but now also being a little bit more abnormal. So maybe it just needed less to turn it into a cancer cell. And plus you have environmental exposure. So like sun and it's on your the, you know top of your skin. So like that could be also something that just at some point you have that you have the hyperplastic growth, and then that's enough to transform it into a cancer much more easily than other cells that need, you know, maybe additional something else, like two hit the two hit hypothesis thing. Yeah. Um, but pancreatic cancer, I think um, what I came up with, what I thought, I don't know if this is true, but pancreatic cells are exposed to a lot of different like potential toxins or things like that. So maybe that has something to do with it, but I couldn't really come up with as good of an explanation of why that was like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious whether it has 
if there's there's classic pairings sometimes that go together like Mick and P53. I just don't rec recollect if if RAS goes well with this mutation because BRAF mutations are very common in melanoma. Yeah. And I believe pancreatic cancers have a lot of RAS type mutations. So I wonder if there's a, a synergy with the RAS and, and loss of this, but um, that's what I was kind of curious about. All right. We actually have some um, excellent sequence data for some of those families. So some of the families that were categorized as FAM that weren't included in the study that I showed don't have a known mutation. So I have sequence data for them. And so one of the things I wanna check, in addition to checking whatever candidate genes are likely to be increasing risk in those families, to see if there's any additional contributors um, right. that interact to, to increase the, or act additively to increase risk of certain cancers in those families. So I'm really curious about that. Hopefully I have enough samples to really look. Yeah, that would be very interesting. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. I'll let others ask. I don't wanna dominate. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, I have a question. Uh, how much do you think like smoking or maybe some sort of carcinogen found in smoking that may accumulate in the bladder has to play with uh, this APOBEC uh, three like mutagenesis signature? Because I know in, in head and neck cancers, we see higher levels of the APOBEC three um, uh, mutation signature, um, even in the HPV negative samples. Um, and it, I think it is, a, it's a little bit higher in the HPV positive samples, but it's still, it's still pretty high. So I'm wondering, is this just like a um, cell type specific signature or does it have something to do with maybe smoking? Cause I know smoking is implicated in both, you know, bladder and head and neck cancers. It could be something where potentially that's how those things increase risk together because it's smoking, you know, is known um, factor increasing risk of bladder cancer. And it leads to its own signature. I think you said that, um, where when you smoke, you also have a particular mutation signature across your genome that's distinguishable from other signatures. So maybe you get, you know, you smoke and then you have lots of mutations from that. And then you also have this APOBEC mutation where you have lots of mutations from that. And then it just comes together and causes so many somatic mutations that your risk is so greatly increased that you develop bladder cancer. But um, I don't know if anyone's looked at that. It'd be interesting to look at that outcome in particular, looking at the signatures and the more seeing if it's just like a signature mutation burden type thing um, in bladder cancer. And maybe that's the mechanism by which bladder cancer happens that combines all of the other factors that just having so many mutations and being exposed to different toxins that end up in your bladder and then also having predisposition for mutations from ABOBAC just all accumulate and that's what happens. The perfect um, storm, yeah. That's... Yeah, someone did look at interactions between, it's a gene, I think it's called NAT2. And that gene um, detoxifies certain, a certain toxin from cigarettes. And it interacts, that interacts with your own, like that genetic risk interacts with smoking. So I know that one interacts with smoking, but that's more related to if you don't have an active enough enzyme, then it can't detoxify and then you expose some more toxins. So there are people looking at that, but I don't know if someone looked at um, what you said, that'd be interesting. Yeah, I, I know, cause you're, you're right. There is like that separate signature for the smoking status that gets pulled out in a lot of cancers. But I thought maybe, you know, there's so many carcinogens in cigarette smokes and, and some of those could accumulate preferentially in the bladder cause it's just, you know, major metabolic um, excretion organs. So I didn't know there could be some interplay there, like you said, but thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremiah. Any more graduate student questions? So I guess, I, Candace, you, you alluded to this in your talk. Um, the risk allele having um, more survival for the APOVEC story. And you said you had an idea. So what is that? <laughs> Go down. Um, so I was like, okay, why would this lead to higher survival? Why would more mutations, which increase your risk of cancer, lead to higher survival? So I had this idea, like maybe you have so much mutation burden in that tissue that when you have like, cause some of these cancer drugs introduce like, mutations and like 
specifically in certain cells and like increase the risk of death in that cell. So it's like maybe there's some interplay between this cell is already very vulnerable. It's already like hyper mutated. And then you have this drug that's making it um, so unhealthy that it can no longer survive with all these mutations already, you know, and then you have the drugs. So maybe they interact with each other. And there was someone who actually um, was studying that. And I think that's what they found um, that it helps the cell to die easier when you treat it with the cancer drug. I forget what drug it was. Is it PDL? I don't, I don't remember, but they, they found that there seemed to be an interaction with that particular cancer drug and it just helped the cells. It targeted them and helped them die better. So it just like seemed to be a treatment effect. I never followed up on that to see like if they really verified that that was what was happening, but. Thank you. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, along the line, I mean, it's it's really interesting with this talk, the number of, so there's an interplay between the SNPs that are used for, for genome-wide association studies, but then there's all these other structural variants, copy number variants, things that are going on. Is there an argument to be made that maybe instead of relying on SNPs, like just sequencing everybody and using that for association is maybe the way to go because then you might also be able to pull out more data about structural variants or is there already enough databases because you obviously did a great job looking at all the databases and getting information to kind of drive your hypothesis. So I wonder if you could comment about that. Yeah, I, I feel like since we since sequencing is so cheap, it's, it's probably important to do that. And so one of the things that I could do that I didn't talk about I'm trying to make it so that I can see this with the TCGA data that I didn't talk about is that I adjusted the models for what was happening in the somatic tissue. So up here, I have copy number variant, I have methylation that I didn't talk about, but I was able to pull data um, on the somatic tissue of what which um, methylation site seemed to have an effect on expression of this gene. And, and did the person have copy number variants in that tumor tissue that could contribute to expression? And so I factored that all in and adjusted that out. And it was important to include, you know, because these other things are acting and so many things happening in the tumor cell that, and, and someone had posted or not posted, published that it's important to account for these things. So it was important in the end, but I feel like TCGA did a good job of developing a very comprehensive data set. But in clinic, you know, it's a, the germline, I don't feel is enough. There's so many things that have happened um, evolutionarily for those cells that you have to consider. And I do think sequencing probably would give you the most answers. Since you mentioned it, can we hear about the methylation? The methylation, I, I didn't really put the slides in here, but I, I looked for um, whatever methylation sites were upstream of these genes from the um, the TCGA database, and I tested um, each one of them for a relationship with expression. And this one that I have here was the one that I used since one of the things I found is that um, methylation sites upstream of a gene will be correlated with each other because like there may be a mechanism that just leads to hypermethylation along that whole region. So I didn't wanna put too many of the CPG island methylation data into the model because it would over adjust. So I picked one of them that kind of were all correlated with each other. So I picked one included in the model to adjust that effect out. Um, and it was, that one was the most like significant. So I just used that one. Fair enough. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, not really a question, but as soon as I asked you about the smoking and the apobec, I, I got on Google because I was curious. <laughs> and um, lung adeno and lung squamous carcinomas also have really high levels of apobec uh, mutagenesis pattern. So probably some smoking going on there in those cancers, cool. I think, too. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Don't, being, don't smoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't I, matter I think what it is. Yeah, in cervical cancer too, I'm pretty sure uh, smoking is a big risk factor for cervical cancer. Um, mm. so, and it's you hmm. see the apobec mutagenesis. So it's like HPV plus uh, smoking. Uh, yeah, <laughs> don't smoke and get, get vaccinated for the HPV, I guess.
Yeah, thank you for that. Anybody else? I don't want to cut anyone short. Um, I don't know how this works, Megan. Do we invite people who want to talk with Candace afterwards or does she have a schedule? Um, so we have like an informal Q&A session that extends um, out for another like 40 minutes if we want. It's kind of flexible. So if people you know, feel like talking and discussing um we can continue like if you know the questions kind of i don't know people are feeling less energetic then we can just um <laughs> we can just close the meeting um if you know i can also stop the uh the recording if people want to talk about you know like future projects so um i guess if there's no more questions i can just stop the recording here and then people that want to stay in chat can Last call for questions? All right.